you're presenting live in front of three to 700 people that's being recorded, that, that's nerve wracking. I remember the first time I presented on one of these calls, I was shaking, literally shaking and hoping, okay, I hope I don't misclick this or misclick that or missay this. One of the things that we started was the buddy system. Allow a new presenter, if they want, to buddy up with another person in the community and feel comfortable and confident going in and knowing it's a team effort. There are people that care about them doing a great job and and want them to feel confident and comfortable and, and keep contributing because everyone does have something valuable to share with the community. Welcome to Power Platform Connections. I'm Hugo Bernier. I am a, a community program manager for the Power Platform. This week, I have the honor to introduce you to the other person that's usually on this call. He's a former MVP. He is now a program manager in a community success team at Microsoft. And he's really all about helping people in the community just achieve more. I'm proud to introduce my colleague, David Warner. David, oh, where'd you go? There you Hello, are. everybody. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, thanks for having me on the show. I uh, I really appreciate it. When when I asked myself, would you like to be on the show today, David? I wasn't really sure I was going to get a yes, to be honest with you. Yeah. Well, I don't know if you've seen this show, uh, but we ask people some questions, personal questions about themselves. So, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yep. <laughs> uh, let's start with, uh, I'd love for you to describe uh, what is it that you do, uh, I, we keep on saying, I'm a program manager and community success team. What does that mean and what are you doing this week? Okay, all right. Well, so um, community program manager uh, is a fancy way of saying that we are here to help the community. So that means that we enable, empower, take blockers out of the way for people. We encourage people, we try to inspire people. Um, essentially, we are here to provide the community enablement to do more with the passion that they have in the technology in which they live. So we encourage others to join calls, like things like community calls, we want to help others do samples, um, essentially get more involved in the community, feel like this is a community for anyone and everyone who wants to be part of it, get more involved. So this week we are uh, just uh, right before the M365 conference, which has a decent amount of power platform presence there. So prepping for that, we just came off of MVP Summit and it was amazing to be able to see all of our incredible community MVPs in person or as many that were able to come. Um, and of course, those that joined virtually, we were able to interact with. So it was a lot of fun. So this week is is prepping for uh, for the M365 conference. Including people in the community and, and empowering people in the community is something that you've been doing even before you joined the, the community success team and before you joined Microsoft. You were an MVP before, but you were a different kind of MVP. I remember calling you uh, an MVP of MVPs because you like to promote other people. Can you talk about why this is important to you to promote others instead of just promoting yourself all the time? When you talk about contributing to the community, it's not just about what you're doing or what you're creating in the community that you want to share. Certainly, we all are doing things for the purpose of others. But I, I know that I would like go to events and I would I would try to tweet about what other people were speaking about in the event to highlight them. Um, I would always look for opportunities to highlight what others were doing on community calls. You know, it's kind of funny. I started joining the community calls and doing a little screenshot summary. And I mean, honestly, I feel like it's something that is completely worthless, no real contributive value to it. I'm just taking screenshots of something that other people are presenting and sharing it with the community in a concise fashion. But um, every time I've said like, ah, I think I should probably stop doing it by now. Uh, everyone's like, no, 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 I love it. So it's really just about taking the work that others are doing and highlighting them, encouraging them, saying thank you, letting them know that we're they're not alone. I think that's important. It's for me, when I got started in the community, it was scary. Um, I thought, no way is anyone like me ever going to be accepted in, into a community uh, of, of passionate, like-minded folks that, you know, MVP, forget about it. Microsoft employee, pff, not me. But the more and more I got involved, the more and more I was inspired to do more for others. And that's really what I enjoy. And I haven't solo presented in so long, not because I'm a you know uncomfortable with it, but because I like collaborating with others. And I like being able to work with others and highlight others. 
Um, that's why we've started things like the recognition program together. We're, we're recognizing the work of what other people are doing in a formal and official way. Credly badges, sharing is caring, which we could always talk a little bit more about, is about enabling others and really just making everyone feel like there's a place for them. In fact, David, that's how you and I met. I remember I was about to do a demo on a community call and you reached out to me uh, via Twitter uh, to find out more about what my demo was going to be. And you asked me for my slides and then you were super encouraging. You're like, you're gonna be awesome. And it's gonna be great and it's gonna be an awesome demo. And I went into that, that demo knowing that I had at least one person rooting for me. And this is something you've been doing behind the scenes for a long time. Do you mind talking about that? Yeah. So, I mean, I think it's something that I, I now do in a formal and official capacity. It's still a passion for me. Um, I help um, Vesa Yuvenin with running the community calls. We have our monthly power platform community call that I host. Uh, I have the assistance of so many other people that we work together on. But yeah, I mean, I think it's important. We have a lot of folks coming in. Um, one, it's important for them to know that it's their community call. It's not just Microsoft that's saying, oh, you're worthy of speaking. No, everyone has to start somewhere. And so uh, often we get folks that are and friends that are speaking or presenting for the first time. Um, and it's important for them to know and be confident and comfortable and know it's just a group of people who are rooting for them and want to see and what they have to share is great. So yeah, I, I usually connect with everyone before the call, uh, well before, sometimes the week before, check in on them, make sure that they're feeling okay, do they have any questions. Um, I'll ask for, you know, their slides obviously for the for the video editor and but but also just to let them know to have fun that they're confident we're there for them ask any questions i always hit them up right after the call and and let them know they did a great job it's important to know that and it's been really inspiring to see what has happened there because in some cases you're presenting live in front of three to 700 people that's being recorded that that's nerve-wracking i remember the first time i presented on one of these calls i was shaking literally shaking and hoping okay i hope i don't misclick this or misclick that or missay this um but really you're just talking to a bunch of friends and so i think one of the things that we started was the buddy system to be able to buddy up uh, allow a new presenter if they want to buddy up with another person in the community whether it be the mvp or microsoft employee um and and feel comfortable and confident going in and knowing it's a team effort uh, because really that's what the community is it's a big team sport big team chemistry i'm big on teams and so it's valuable to let them know that there are people that care about them doing a great job and and want them to feel confident and comfortable and, and keep contributing because everyone does have something valuable to share with the community and so we've seen folks that have never presented before do a buddy system presentation uh, with with teenagers uh, in the community. With one, I know for a fact, um, Chandani, uh, we did a buddy system call with her. She's now an MVP contributing amazing work. And so you just sometimes need that little extra oomph of confidence. And you can't always find it by yourself. I know that with with me, if I had not had the support of folks like Vesa and Chris and you and others in the community helping me along the way, I, I would have probably given up on myself a long, long time ago in terms of feeling like I could be part of the community. You and I, we have a tendency to co-present uh, on everything. There's kind of a reason for it, but uh, we'd love for, for you to, to explain your point of view, why we always present together. I think that one of the reasons that I love co-presenting, and it's not just you, I mean, I'll present with other people as well. Um, what? I, I know, I know. Uh, but uh, I think it's a good example, right? One, it sets a good example of co-presenting together that we are a collaborative community. And I always say the sun never sets on the community because every single day all around the globe, folks are, and friends are working together in our community for the betterment of learning something new or creating something new that others will benefit from. There's always an opportunity to work with others, even if you've not known anyone. If you're seeing someone present on something um, or on a community call or at a conference, don't be afraid to go talk to them. Start a conversation because you might have an opportunity to start working together. I, th I think that that happened to you and I in the past and, and April Dunham, who is a good friend now, mm -hmm. we all came from different perspectives of passion and we, I, I 
came to the two you and said, hey, I got an idea for a session. Would you be willing to collaborate with me on it? And lo and behold, it, it became a session that became a keynote and was beloved by many people that have seen it. But it would have never happened had I not been willing to say, hey, are you willing to work with me and collaborate with me on this endeavor or this idea? And you didn't tell me no. You didn't say, well, I've got better things to do or I'll see what I can do or if I can fit you in. And that's really that's really the foundation of, of this community is that everyone is willing to help out. So speaking of helping others, uh, can you help me uh, in explaining what's the deal with your background? I thought you were going to ask me to help you uh, <laughs> connect your printer, actually. <laughs> Since you work at Microsoft, can you I connect I need to my move this weekend. Yeah, uh, no, your back your your background. That's a that's a real background. Uh, that's yeah, background, right? yeah, it is. It's funny how many calls I join and folks are like, "That's a crazy virtual background. How do you have it moving?" And I'm like, "Well, that's real." So uh, during the pandemic, I just started doing more video and wanted to be comfortable sharing my camera. And and honestly, it also is intentional uh, in terms of trying to create a conversation piece. So I'm a big American football fan, big hockey fan. Um, and originally I started putting up like actual helmets of teams and, and kind of funny enough, you get on calls with people who are fans and they are fanatical. And if it's a team they don't like, they're even more fanatical and it <laughs> kind of set the tone. They're like, I don't like that team. And then they were kind of grumpy for the entire call. <laughs> so, um, with my wife who I love and supports all of my endeavors, um, she helped me kind of personalize it. She's real crafty. So we got a lot of helmets, painted them, custom decal them. You'll notice these are all Microsoft themes, right? So either community themed or, or my blog, uh, power platform here or Microsoft, uh, trying to do that while I'm looking back, you, or Microsoft uh, theme there. So it's it's more of a conversation starter. And then I think that when we get on calls, it makes some uh, everyone a little bit more comfortable. All of a sudden you start getting to know one another. And really at the end of the day, that's, I think, what I'm so passionate about is that the human connection. That's why on this call, we always start out with kind of getting to know a person of whatever their favorite food or favorite city or movie or something like that. Because take the technology away, we're still humans. Speak for yourself. <laughs> it's more machine now than man. <laughs> You're able to rely on those relationships uh, beyond the technology um, we all eventually will move on to new jobs or new industries. And I think that being able to build those relationships are going to kind of span across jobs or technology or industries. And they're also going to create a stronger bond. It's a labor of love. Uh, and of course, it includes, you know, some of my favorite colors. So, David, uh, I, we like to talk about how people got started in the industry and with Power Platform. What was your first job? Uh, so wasn't necessarily doing development, although uh, I was kind of born with a mouse in my hand. I've said that before, always been involved with computers, but love technology, self-taught, right? So I don't have a degree in any of this, but I think uh, my my very first job was actually doing animatronics, robots, essentially. It was in high school, in fact. Um, uh, there was a no I live in Los Angeles, so there was a number of companies around here that did it. Less digital back then. Yes, I'm dating myself. So there was more animatronics companies. And I reached out to every single one of them and said, hey, I'm a student. I'd like to do an article for the school creative writing book. Um, I had talked my creative writing teacher to give me a two-page spread to do anything I want, no questions asked. And I would publish her book for it, do all the, the graphics for it. So then I took that kind of empowerment that she gave me and I went and I interviewed owners and uh, interviewed them, took photos, um, and then went back to give them the book and, and not so subtly told them, of course, I'm doing this because I'm passionate. I want to get more involved in the industry. Uh, and would you be willing to let me intern? And one of them said, well, we can't let you intern, but we can hire you. S paid almost nothing, but I would have worked for free. But I got to, to learn how to program and create essentially animatronics. And so I built uh, the, I got to work on the Wizard of Oz attraction at MGM Grand when it first opened, kind of the talking 10-man scarecrow Dorothy and the little Toto that ended up getting stolen and kind of taken all over the world, which is kind of funny. Um, not by me. I wasn't the guy. Uh, and, uh, and work on talking birds and like a little uh, Marilyn Monroe and Frank Sinatra and Elvis Bird. So it was very, very cool doing all of that while in high school. So I've always kind of been, you know, very eager to try to get involved and in, and. In, in, and be passionate and show that passion. Um, and I think that that's kind of how I've gotten here is I love getting on, for example, the community calls and encouraging others, bringing a lot of energy. Uh, not sure if everyone else loves it, but uh, but I certainly enjoy trying to pump up the volume. <laughs>
So David, you, you've mentioned a few times now that uh, you don't have a degree. And that's typically a very taboo subject. People don't talk about not having a degree. Uh, do you mind talking about you know, how you got through without having a degree and whether you feel that's important nowadays? It's an interesting topic. Um, I, I think that it's honestly, it's something that's been a challenge. I think, I, you know, it's funny. I, I think with the advent of technology now being so available and learning about the technology being so available, certification, stuff like that, it's not as much of a taboo thing anymore, I feel. Um, but I think when I was growing up, uh, I, you know, I, I lived in a family of, of four. So I had um, three older sisters, no brothers. My parents weren't super rich. And so there wasn't a lot of um, opportunity for me to go to the universities or go to college or anything like that. Um, but I remember being determined to teach myself. And so I would go <laughs> when we used books, the old rocks books. I don't know if you all remember those red and yellow rocks, W-R-O-X rocks books didn't have as much of the internet. And that's how you learned how to program and stuff like that, I would go to either the library or I would go to Barnes and Noble and I would buy a book and, and I knew I could get it returned within a day or two and <laughs> I'd fly into the radar. Um, so I'd go home and I'd read it immediately and I'd read it cover to cover and then I would take notes and learn how to implement it and I would take it back and I would get another book because didn't have enough, they were expensive and didn't have enough. So I did that to the point where I was able to learn and implement and, and do all of those things. Um, about programming and, and learning how to code. And, you know, at that time I was doing a lot of uh, graphic design and 3D graphics and, and programming. Um, and, and so much so that when I was dating my wife, I always joke that she knew what she was getting into with me because I would be at dinner with her on a date and everyone's going to laugh at me for this, but I would have the rocks book open because I always had to stay one step ahead. Um, because as I would go to these interviews, I would get asked that all the time. So you don't have a degree and that would be perceived as not being able to, to do a job. Like mm -hmm. you couldn't see through going to a, a college and finishing that level of education. And, and that's fine if that's the decision that others wanna make. For me, it wasn't an option. And so I kind of had to always prove to myself and to others that, okay, I may not have a degree, but I promise you I'm going to work harder than anyone that you <laughs> anyone that you're going to hire, I'm willing to work harder. So yeah, it was interesting because I remember, I remember sitting in an interview where someone asked me that, right? They said, so explain to me why I should hire you when others have number of years of education. And, and I said, I promise you, no one is going to work harder and no one has spent more time. I, I've been using technology since I was a little kid. And, and you're not going to find anyone that's going to bring more passion and desire. And, and that's what I had to do. So every, every minute of opportunity that I had to seek another, um, another level or another proof that I could do a job, I had to, I had to spend time learning. Uh, and, and it was not easy. It was not easy. And I can vouch for you that, uh, you know, having worked with you now for the better part of last year, that and working with you before that, before you joined Microsoft, that I don't think I've ever met someone as passionate about helping others and about making others uh, more successful. And the, the whole thing about having to be the one that's always ahead of, of other people and learning, learning uh, whatever you say. <laughs> Trying to make sure that I'm uh, I'm up on the latest and uh, able to yeah. do the job, regardless if I've got, you know, regardless if I've got the degree to prove it. And I understand that. So, like, I, I try to be empathetic. I think empathy is the most important quality that any of us can employ because you there's just too many different people in the world. And we're all going through too many different things to fully say, oh, I, I know what that person's going through. I've done that. Well, chances are we haven't, but mm -hmm. we can try to put ourselves in their shoes. And so for me, I know that I had to work so hard in certain situations to say, hey, I can do this. Just give me a shot that uh, and, and many times I wasn't and and or I had to, to kind of scrap for it that I think others shouldn't have to go through that feeling of inadequacy. No one should ever, ever be put in a position where they feel like you're not you're, you can't do this just because they don't have a certain pedigree or something like that. Yeah, I've I've been asked to hire a lot of team members for a lot of back when I was an independent consultant for my clients. 
And the one thing that I would always look for was not someone who necessarily had a degree. Uh, I wouldn't hold it against them or anything like that. But in IT, it doesn't really matter what you know today. Uh, because tomorrow technology will have changed. I mean, look, there was no such thing as chat GPT in I think October, November last year. And now it's in every product that we're that we're working with. What's yep. important is your ability to learn. And uh, you know, I think you and I have talked about this before. The ideal team member is someone who's smart, someone who's driven, and someone who's humble, right? Because if uh, they have all those those values, you know that they're never going to feel that too good to to learn. Uh, you know that they're going to want to learn, and they're going to be smart enough to figure things out, even if they don't know about something. So, yeah. thank you for for being brave and talking about that because that's something that, frankly, a lot of people uh, are not willing to talk about. It's the only story I got. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody, enough about me. Let's talk about you and all the amazing work that you've been doing over the past week. If you would like us to highlight your information, by the way, you can do so by tagging your content with Power Platform Connects, that thing right there. Just go ahead and throw that on the end of your Twitter or LinkedIn, and we will make sure to track it down. Hugo, what do you got for us this week? Awesome. Thank you, David. Uh, well, the first article we have is by Dennis Hudeburr. Uh, who has written about getting stream video viewers and views. So within stream on SharePoint, it is possible to upload, share, and manage videos. But in this article, what Dennis does is he shows you how to retrieve analytics via Power Automate or a Power Automate flow uh, for such type of video files. And we have some cool stuff in this article. So Stream used to be a completely separate product. However, uh, recently, uh, Stream has been moved to SharePoint. And so the cool thing about that is it allows you to take advantage of all the SharePoint functionality. And the additional benefit of that, of course, is that you're able to use the out-of-the-box analytics features as well. So Dennis uses Power Automate to call the get item analytics method from the Graph API. And this is a great example of the using uh, an HTTP request, sending an HTTP request to SharePoint to call an API that is not available as a connector. And with the get item analytics me method, you can now specify if you want to retrieve the all time analytics or just the last seven days. And that's exactly what uh, Dennis does in this example. Again, you don't have to just limit yourself to something that is available or you don't have to limit yourself to the method that Dennis is using. What Dennis is showing is a great example of calling all uh, sorts of APIs using the send HTTP request on SharePoint. Our next one is by Keith Atherton. And Keith is talking about the Power Apps Gallery Control. Uh, and there's a for all gotcha there. Uh, so recently, Keith came across a Power App gallery control uh, and for all gotcha that he managed to handle um, and he wanted to share uh, here just in case anyone else is experiencing the same issue. And so the challenge is if Keith was using the as operator to uh, to look to alias each record in a collection just to make his code easier to read, right? You can use as to basically say, retrieve something and store it as this variable. However, what Keith found is in a looped control, uh, he found that the first record was being duplicated. And as you can see here, the first record uh, is dog and it shows dog on all records in his example. So what Keith did, uh, he used the with function instead. We've already covered the with function uh, a few weeks ago. But using the with function, we're able to create basically a temporary scope that allows us to um, make our code simpler. And with using the with, I was going to say with the with function, uh, we're able to actually get all the individual records, even though it's in a looped control. So that's a great article. We got the results we wanted here. Good job, Keith, for sharing that. Our next is by Michael Mijel, who's talking about adding GitHub reviewers with Power Automate. So as a software developer or a team lead, right, you know that it's really important to do code reviews to make sure that you maintain the quality of your code base, especially 
if you're working in a, an environment where maybe some of your developers are new and then maybe they're makers and you want to make sure that you're maintaining all the controls for security, privacy, accessibility, and so on and so forth. So now, unfortunately, managing and assigning reviewers for your GitHub pull request can be very time consuming. And this is something that uh, Michael had to deal with uh, if he had, uh, because he had a large team and multiple projects to manage. So uh, the other challenge that uh, Michael was facing is assigning reviewers by policy, uh, which is something you can do, is not always sufficient. And sometimes just manually assigning special reviewers just won't scale if you have a large project. So in this article, Michael really talks about uh, Power Automate Flow to automatically add GitHub reviewers. And so what uh, Michael does here, and I really like this, is he shows the before and after. Right? So he shows the manual process, which consists of creating a pull request, checking work items, and adding reviewers in a loop. And then he shows the after process, uh, where he's automated it. And so it's very much the same steps, but he uses the GitHub pull request trigger, and then he calls GitHub APIs to get the details of the pull request. And then in his case, he calls the uh, AWS Lambda function to get the backlog details from Jira. But you could absolutely use the same approach to get the information from whatever system you need uh, to suit your needs. And uh, you know, we're using the request review via the GitHub REST API. So uh, unfortunately, again, this is a theme today. We don't have a standard action to assign reviewers on a GitHub pull request. So we had to call the GitHub REST API using a send HTTP request. And this is, again, a great example of using Power Automate to create flows and to automate business processes across various tools and technologies, again, to meet your business needs, whether the APIs are available through a, a built-in connector or whether using a custom connector uh, to do so. So good job on that. And then Kat Schneider, the JSON whisperer, she actually has created an article about number data. And so in this article, what Kat does is she talks about the various types of numbers. So numbers, whole numbers, integers, decimals, fractions, floating points, and currencies, both positive and negative. But then she talks about really the, I don't know if you remember this, but the PEMDAS, right? The parent parentheses, exponents, multipl uh, multiplications and divisions, uh, additions and subtractions. And so she talks about how operations in PowerFX and PowerApps in general are actually subject to the same rules as mathematic, mathematic rules. And so when you start building more and more complicated apps, you do need to understand how power apps will follow the logic. Uh, and this is where, again, understanding the, the PEMDAS rule of math will work. And one of the things that's important is if you have nested or nesting more than one formula, that means that you're able to call one formula inside of another. And that can happen many times and multiple times. And so uh, understanding, again, the rules of math will apply. And if you're someone who's coming from an Excel background, uh, this is really cool because the PowerFX formula language was really built on the same foundation that was used to create uh, Excel functions. And the formula bar really is the same concept as uh, what's used in Excel, except, of course, that it's souped up because it uses PowerFX. But the rules of parentheses uh, still apply. All of that to say also that uh, if you understand that, you understand how to nest in the, the order of operations. Uh, but that also allows you to use something uh, like semicolons to chain formulas together. Uh, in this case, the example that Kat is showing, she is really chaining a whole bunch of functions together to uh, do one job. And then we have Rick Baker, who has just published version two of something that he calls PACO. Uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, but PACO. And, and PACO or PACO is really uh, two Power Apps, Canvas apps that he's created that contain many Canvas components and where he can actually create functional and good looking Canvas apps in no time. So it, this is available in a GitHub repository. You can download it and you can use it as you will. Uh, but it's got basically the Paco Core, which is the main Canvas components. And then he's got the Paco Extra, which really adds additional Canvas components that you can use. 
uh, in, in your applications. And you can really do a lot more in less time using some of the components that are built in. And best part, uh, you don't need premium Power App licenses to, to, to need to use the PACO. Uh, the, the Canvas component really contains several settings. And depending on the Canvas component, you just need to adjust your to your own needs. And because they are Canvas components, you can even make changes to Canvas component in your own existing Power Apps, leveraging the knowledge that you have. And here I have a screenshot of a cool example of what he's done using PACO. All you need to use the PACO Canvas components, uh, you need to enable two experimental features, so the enhanced component properties uh, and the parse JSON function and untype object. Uh, these features, by enabling those two features, you'll be able to leverage all the richness of the PACO Canvas components. And best of all, each PACO component has extensive documentation, which can be found in the components folder in GitHub. So great job on this. I can't wait to see more of uh, PACO. And that's it for us. All right, thanks everybody for watching today and we appreciate all of our contributors that submitted their articles and blogs for us to review. If you would like us to highlight your creations, then definitely we can do that. Just tag your posts on Twitter and LinkedIn with Power Platform Connects. That one, usually I'm over there, over there, over there, yeah. Power Platform Connects, and we will scour the interwebs to find everything. Now, that's not the only thing you can do. Hugo, what else can they do? Well, funny you should ask, because if you want to go to our Power Users community and you want to ask questions, answer questions, answer questions and help others in general, you can go to aka.ms slash join the community, and you can become one of those amazing community members. Uh, we are all stronger together, and we love to see everyone helping each other in the community. So thank you, everyone. We'll see you there. Awesome. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Haha, I get the microphone all to myself this week. Packo it up, pack it in, let it begin. <laughs> Were you rehearsing oh. those things while I was talking? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm being attacked by my dog. Okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> this whole, uh, ink, yeah. You're so lovingly creating for the benefit of, uh, I'm just gonna restart that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs>